So I came to the United Methodist Church when I was in middle school. I started worshiping at Grace Community in Shreveport. And I worship, I love the preaching. I love the way that I was made to feel very welcome. And soon enough, Stacy Hood had asked me to start participating in things and helping with some AV stuff. And uh, before you know it, I'm spending every Thursday evening and Saturday afternoon and Sunday morning at the church. And through hearing uh, Rob Weber's sermons about four times a week and hearing the worship music, I think, you know, we have two or three rehearsals and four services. So every Wesleyan hymn seven times a week, (laughs) eventually it starts to work on your heart and just change you. And um, I answered my call to ordain ministry when I was a sophomore in college, I was actually on the phone um, in, in Atlanta, Georgia at Oglethorpe University, just called to check in with Stacy, who was still a mentor and, uh, and still is a mentor. And out of my mouth came this phrase, I'm considering a call to ordination. And I actually hadn't been, and I hadn't said that to anybody. <laughs> and it just popped out. And immediately I felt this huge release and this very light feeling. And Stacy said, I'm so glad you figured that out because I did not want to be the one to tell you about it. <laughs> and, and she connected me with Rob Weber and continued down the path from there. It's been about a decade since then, but that is where I began this journey to ordained ministry. I've been asked to grow and stretch and try new things in ministry. And one of those was preaching bilingual service. And I have some skills in Spanish, but I'm not a native speaker. And uh, reading scripture in more than one language gives you so much insight into the fullness of the text. And on our first Palm Sunday in the bilingual service, I was reading the scripture. I love Palm Sunday. I I love Palm Sunday more than Easter. Um, It feels more like a family celebration and everybody is very happy and there's no stress. And it was a great day. And as I was reading it in Spanish out loud for the first time, the English speaking worshipers caught on to a word that I didn't, didn't realize when I was preparing for the service, how strange it would sound. But as we know, the scriptures tell us Jesus enters Jerusalem uh, on a young donkey, or uh, as I've learned, as I read it out loud, Jesus came in on a burrito. Uh, so I could not stop laughing <laughs> with this image of um, our Savior, Jesus returning to the holy city, entering, riding on a burrito. That was um, the whole congregation, English and Spanish, all understood the comedy of that moment, even though we maybe couldn't use our words to explain why that was so hilarious, but (laughs) it caught everybody off guard. It was just a very special moment there. You know, I was baptized in the Episcopal Church at St. Paul's in Shreveport, and most consistently spent... Uh, chapel services at St. Mark's Cathedral in Shreveport and listen to M.L. Agnew preach regularly and also grew up in the Catholic Church in Shreveport and listen to Monsignor Provenza preach homilies weekly. But the most impactful sermons were from Rob Weber at Grace Community and just an amazing preacher who could tell a story to help you dive deeper into the mysterious nature of what it means to be human and to be loved so incredibly by your creator. Um, So I'm thankful for all those people who prepared weekly to speak to me, whether I was willing to listen or not. Um, I'm especially thankful for my family who have been very flexible and understanding in this call to ministry. You know, my parents fully expected me to uh, pursue a career where I would make money. (laughs) And they were disappointed. Uh, that, that that's not the path I chose, but very supportive. Meanwhile, um, so incredibly thankful for my husband, Sean, who would just bend over backwards to support my dreams and my calling, uh, even if that means changing zip codes, changing careers, um, changing homes. He's on board for it, and, and I cannot be more thankful. And I'm really thankful for the women who have come before me. I know that this pathway to ordination is complicated for everybody, Uh, deacons are a young order and our pathway is even less clear, but there have been so many women who have paved this way so that I could walk here and especially grateful for Lindy Broderick who understood all of my emotions and all of my feelings as I journeyed through this pathway. 
In our conference, we had several opportunities during phase one of the pandemic for our pastors, our clergy to meet together, uh, both for just spiritual encouragement and connection, and also for advice and sharing wisdom and understanding. And um, I cannot remember which one of these wonderful people said this, but one of our pastors on a, a Zoom call, probably hosted by Todd, said that, uh, that our pandemic is an accelerator, that it moved us more quickly towards trends that were already existing, already surfacing in the church. And so while there are a lot of difficulties we're working through, how to connect, together in the same way we have been. We're also seeing people who are leaning in and going deeper in their faith, uh, working harder to make people feel welcome and feel part of the body of Christ. And we're recognizing that some people who, who like the habit, like the pattern, uh, are not connecting in that same way. And I think it's important for the church to look at itself with honest eyes. And this has given us an opportunity to honestly ask which ministries do we require which ministries uh, give this community hope and purpose? Uh, which traditions are most important to our expression of God's love for us and for others? And so I'm grateful for the opportunity in this pandemic to ask some serious questions about our traditions and our energy and our focus in the mission field. I grew up uh, in an environment that was very encouraging where there were so many talented, gifted people around me. And everybody was encouraged to pursue what their passion was. And while my friends were able to share that at an early age, I want to be a doctor, I want to be a lawyer. I, I just had a classmate who was elected to public office in D.C. I mean, incredible people. I did not have that same clarity. Uh, I just had this passion and connection to be connected to to be connected to people who are in need, people who are hurting, because that's who the church had been for me. And the more I looked at the opportunities before me, the more clear it became that I, I couldn't look away from people who were hurting, from people who were living in dark places, people who need of a word of hope uh, and need of something to change their life. And the further along I moved in my academic career, the harder it became to resist that call that I should do anything but devote my life to being a source of good news, uh, a source that would connect people who have and are wanting to give to those who are in need and feeling alone. And I can't shake it. I really can't. Even when you have had uh, a very rough week, when you have been so close to people's tragedies, when you have been stretched beyond what you were capable of, it's still impossible to look away from the need and not say, I know something. I am connected to this eternal source that gives me hope. And I want to invite you to join in me. Join me with that. I want to invite you to join with me in experiencing that. So I'm in this ministry because I can't shake it. There, there are days I'd to lose, but I can't shake it because God has got me. And I'm so thankful for that.